right, I'm delighted to be here. I arrived on Monday night and saw a bit of Pensacola. That means nothing really at one level. I don't really know much about you, but uh, let's see where we go with this talk. Um, one of the things I want to do is I took a few pictures of Pensacola as we wandered around. So try and weave in Pensacola. But on the other hand, I want to talk about a little journey, what makes great cities and so on. And one of the things I think is really quite interesting from my few conversations over the last two days is that whatever the situation is, there seem to be some hard decisions being taken and so on. But what just strikes me, you know, being in a place like this, you know, the weather's warm, the sand, sunshines, all of that sort of stuff. You go boating and it's more perhaps a combination of, as one of those boats says, no drama, life's very good. And quite often that can be very bad from the point of view of the future of cities because, you know, one doesn't really dare do things. And I think I would say that most places today are in some kind of crossroads. And the reason I'm just focusing on decisions is that many people think that if you make a decision, it's always going to be downhill. Things are always going to get worse because it might have always been better in the past or, or, or whatever else. So I'm going to raise a few questions with you as we go along because I just thought initially I was going to do a presentation where I sort of talk and all of that but I've decided to put everything over to you that you have to make all the decisions and you have to do the thinking. So firstly my question to you is Pensacola are you ready for the urban conversation i.e. that you do in a civilized way talk across tables or without tables you don't get into any, any bung fights you sort of relax you listen to the other person you don't talk at cross purposes today. I mean, I found this image that I had, but people kept on doing this. No, you're responsible, you're responsible. Three people, different people, they didn't know each other, went, he, she, she's responsible. So I don't know what that means, but it seems to be something about Pensacola. Not quite who's in charge, <laughs> but uh, you, you get the drift. Um, so that's why my first question is, is are you, could, could you actually have an urban conversation where you do a bit of where are we going type stuff and at the same time keep that big picture focus, listen to the things that might be happening before one drowns in the detail which always gets jumped up immediately before one's even finished the sentence. This is a very common experience. I'm just asking, I'm, I'm not sure whether Pensacola is like that or not, you know. Um, because I think that point, because obviously the world's changing dramatically and all of that sort of stuff, we do, and I think cities in particular, need to give themselves time for reflection and at least the possibility to stand back. This is um, the fire and water thing in Providence, Rhode Island, where that guy at least is thinking about life. Um, so really, that, uh, that's the thought I'll leave you with. Big picture thinking or drowning in detail. Now, one of the things I'm associated with this idea of the creative city, and you might be asking, well, what the hell is that? And who cares? And does it matter? We'll come to why we th I think it might matter. But there are four ways that people tend to look at this. When someone says the word, the creative city, many people think, oh, it must be the arts, the arts. You must be talking about the arts, which obviously the arts have some form of creativity. And I think one of the greatest things about the arts is just the way people think in arts in trying to achieve things. So clearly, perhaps a creative city is about the arts, but it certainly isn't, in my view, exclusively about the arts, even though the arts might stretch you, it might challenge you, you might enjoy it, and all of that sort of thing. So that's a very limited view. Another view might be that the creative city is really the creative economy, I strong music industry, strong design industry, all of that sort of stuff. And again, I'm assuming that you have some of that, and you do interesting things, your designers. I'm not saying you do bags like that. <laughs> Uh, or, well, you perhaps want to go back to that. I wouldn't, you know. It's not the sort of thing you should look at for too long. Um, but you might uh, also do another bag like that. Or, you, you know, there are lots of things you could do. And we would hope that all the things you're doing in your design sense, and of course, there's much more to design than bags. I appreciate it. There's industrial design and all of that. Um, but one can be very clever with, 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 with design. So that's a second variation of what you might call a creative city, having a strong fabric of people who can do this sort of stuff. A third definition might be, and you heard, some of you heard, and some of you I thought, 
I don't know if you liked him or disliked him, it doesn't really matter. Uh, Richard Florida, who talked about the creative class, and of course, that class includes arty people, and it includes those designer people, and it includes, of course, the sort of people who can do this thing, which, which Ken showed me earlier today, you know, putting something on your tongue, and if you're blind, you can see, or whatever. I don't know what all this is about, but I know it's bloody creative. Whoever did that uh, really had something to say, and we saw this big thing earlier in the day as well. So in the creative class, there are also those scientists, those people who think about things in, a, in, a, in an engineering, technical sense, and so on. But again, you know, many people say, well, and that is a group of, let's say, 30%. That means all the rest of us are pretty boring, because we're completely boring, uncreative administrators, and that sort of stuff. Uh, now, that's why I, I've all, I wrote my first book about Creative City about 15 years ago, have always felt that a creative city is actually something broader. It's a place where you might find an interesting social worker, you might find an interesting business person, a bureaucrat, whatever. But it's basically a place which has a culture of creativity, a culture of more likely to say yes and less likely to say no. And of course, one of the main preconditions about creativity in general, leaving aside that it isn't always wild and like that, is that you do reflect, you're tolerant, all of those sorts of things, which is why I talked about the urban conversation. So if you were just to simplify what a creative city is, it's something like that. I mean, you can read the words there, confident citizens in a world that's all very diverse and so on. It's something that's about, in, you know, it empowers people. This is a consultation exercise on a skyscraper, a green skyscraper in Vancouver. It's all about curiosity, as you can see. And particularly, it's about really finding imaginative solutions to things or opportunities, identifying them in an innovative and inventive way. So at its simplest, it's the opposite of this. This is in Albania. Albania has about a collection of 25,000 bunkers from their former era. These are in cities, and they look at you, these bunkers, because you, you might be doing something wrong. So the creative city is the opposite of that. It's a place where you've got the conditions where people can think about things, plan things, and then act also, most importantly, act in an imaginative way. And to me, we've been talking a bit about IHMC today, about how it operates. And it's very much, this is, about a, this is a micro world which reflects what I believe a creative city is, which is less thinking from the center of what you know but more at the edge of your competence. Because if you're a transport planner or uh, whatever you else you are, we know what you know, and we seem you know that. But if we've got an interesting problem, we want to know how you are going to connect with the next person with you. And so basically, for me, creativity is really about thinking at the edge of your competence, not at the center of it. Now, just in case people think that I'm just only talking about the novel, it's only the novel that's really creative, quite often it's incredibly creative and certainly bold and courageous to say no. And that in itself can be creative. So sometimes, for example, keeping the historical fabric can be the thing that later on inspires people to invent things anew as distinct from having something that completely, you know, where you erase memory. And if you look at the Eiffel Tower and you spent a month thinking about it, analyzing what's in there, the innovations of that, that sentence I've just put there, today's classics, might have been yesterday's innovation. Equally today, perhaps it might be about creating today's innovations, which might be tomorrow's heritage. So I'm just really saying it's not sort of just the new that, 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 that I'm talking about. Just look at this for an example. Now, on the left, you recognize this is probably Amsterdam. No, no it isn't probably, it is. Uh, it is Amsterdam. Now, on the right, that's also Amsterdam. But in fact, and this is what's interesting for me in Pensacola, because you've got lots of gaps everywhere. You're not going to have everything as uh, pastiche, heritage. Obviously, it's fine if you're doing it in your heritage quarter. But how are you going to invent interesting new buildings that somehow speak to the past in a way, but incredibly modern? So that is actually also Amsterdam. And this is social housing in there somewhere. I bet, I don't know where it is anymore, I've forgotten. Or if you take that, this again is very much the heritage but new of Amsterdam. But when you look at it like that, it looks like a confusing mess. But when you know that building one and eight, two and seven, three and six, five and four are the same, you've got a sort of unity in diversity thing going on. 
Now, when you're looking at cities, one of the biggest problems uh, on the creativity front is the rise of risk culture. So if you read a risk policy, it used to be called risk and it meant opportunity as well. It always talks about the worst case scenario that something ever happened. I mean, I think Ken or someone told me today that there was some battle about some road and the guy's saying, unless two fire engines simultaneously can be crossing each other's path with a gap in between, this won't work. How many times have you seen two fire engines go to two different fires crossing each other across the road? Wouldn't make sense, would it? Because they'd already have... You get the drift, yeah? Have you got that? They would never be crossing the road if it was really important crossing each other that way because they'd already have stayed back. So you see that that's a sort of logic that leads um, in, a, in a way that never makes us do anything. So in a sense, what I'm talking about is a sort of this mental agility is one of the key things that makes a creative city because a creative city is essentially a collection of people who live and work in organizations who then come together in some form of way. So if you were thinking of a metaphor in your mind about a place that is imaginative and forward-looking, I prefer jazz to symphony orchestras. Nothing against the symphony, but there is one leader who directs things and all of that. In the ideal world, you have lots of leaders, and in that sense, jazz is quite democratic. If it works well, we each can have a turn at being, in a sense, king or queen. Um, and when it works well, it's good music. So the other little point, and this is my last point on creativity, is so often people think creativity is only that thing about having the ideas over there. That's all the exciting stuff. Then the boring people come in. Again, in Florida's definition, this is all the boring people. These people who turn things into reality, who then network it, circulate it, create platforms where you can buy and sell it and see it, and then, in a sense, engender the discussion for a new idea to happen. So it's quite useful to look at that in terms of the whole cycle of, of, of something, a process, a project, or whatever else. So partly what I'm saying, this road here, I found it the other day. I mean, I think you'll guess where this street is. There's a street called Logic Lane. Tell me where it would be. It's, of course, Oxford, England. So we go to Oxford, England. There is a street called Logic Lane. Nothing against logic. We're in a scientific institution a bit. But there's something beyond logic. And what I suppose I'm saying is if you think differently, you do things differently, and sometimes different things. And I'm certainly not suggesting that Pensacolaites sort of have this as their new traditional ritual, although it might be quite interesting. Um, but you get the idea. Now, I'm now switched a bit because this I saw at the design center of uh, Copenhagen's design, whatever it's called, exchange. And I was just thinking, what the hell is this new book about, this art of city making, Lark? And then I said, yes, that's it. Reading that on the floor, I suddenly realized it's not about being the most creative place in the world. How utterly boring. It's the most creative place for the world, giving something back. Obviously, many projects, and I'm not going to go into them today, that do that. There are many, and many are for the community. If you, for example, have a Wi-Fi zone in one of your parks, that's, in a sense, giving a gift to the citizenry. It's giving something back. It's free, ideally. Well, it should be free. Like Bryant Park, New York. That's a small idea. But in an ideal world, you want to give something for the world, be creative for the world, in a sense, be carbon neutral. You know, you've got so much sun. I haven't seen any, I don't know, perhaps there are lots of solar heating things going on or solar cooling or whatever, but I haven't seen any in Pensacola at the moment. So that's, for me, really important, is to provide an ethical framework for, for this sort of imaginative thinking, as it were. Now, here I'm just going to throw some words at you. And I've also seen some other words out there, which I think you should also be. Beautiful Pensacola, glorious, genuine, heroic, innovative, spirited. Oops, sorry, the spirited one's fallen on the floor. But this is a summary of the words that if you added up the Jane Jacobs, all the people and ordinary folk, particularly, what they think great places are like. Now, isn't it interesting? The first word is lovable. The main task, and if any people are city ma uh, manager type folks here, is to make people, in my view, fall in love with their city. <laughs> now, oh, well, well, I'm, I'm glad you agree. Well, anyway, you get the drift. <laughs> Now, that is normally not, I mean, I don't know whether in these normal meetings people even would dare to use the word love, but anyway, 
lovable, livable, joyful. Yeah? That's one set of words. Another set of words, this is slightly edgier, is as indeed edgy, vital, dynamic, all of that. But you're already seeing, as I put these words out, that some of them are quite lively and moving around and energetic words, and others are incredibly calm words. And what you can see is great places manage to deal with contradictory things at the same time. A great place can be both stimulating and calm at the same time. So that, to me, is one of the essences of a place that seems to work. Uh, I'm not repeating the words because you can read them yourself. But here, just as an example, is another social housing project, which probably to you looks completely insane. It's in Vienna, which is done by an artist. But it's one of the most popular social housing projects where people want to live. Everything's a bit curvy, not many straight lines. If you ask people, do you prefer straight lines or curves? They normally say curves. Cities always straight lines, yeah. So it's quite funny. One of the sentences I sometimes use is, all the cities we love... We can't build anymore because the rules forbid them. It's quite an interesting thought. That everything, if you say, if, you, if we had a brainstorming session and said what we loved, what we liked, and we talked about places and identified it, and then we put the rule thing onto it, we probably couldn't do it because of the fire engine and things like that. So anyway, so you can see that these great places have a sort of balance. They're a balance between, in here I've said wildness and order, and they obviously deal with the basic things like uh, noise and dirt and so on. But the most important thing about cities is that they're resilient and robust. And you've obviously had those challenges with the Ivan and all of that. But that, that resilience is perhaps one of the key words there. Now, another thing about places that are vital and viable. Now, you may not want to be vital or viable. You want to, may, may want it completely calm. But if you do want it energetic in the sense of economics and so on... Then there are some other words that are quite important. Critical mass of stuff, of activity, etc., etc., etc. Another word is obviously distinctiveness and identity. This is in Spain, uh, Salvador Dali's museum. But you have your version of distinctiveness we know. Another word is innovative capacity. Now that is Venice, as you know. And the reason I'm putting that up is again that we don't always think that the innovations are tomorrow's innovations. Some of yesterday's innovations were incredibly innovative because that wasn't built by a business-as-usual approach. The way the dominance of Venice worked ultimately as a city was incredibly sophisticated at a governance level, at a, you know, just a pure building technique level and so on. So here I'm using innovation, but again, you can see I'm always switching back past, present, and future. Obviously, diversity, diversity in terms of insights, different types of people, and so on, rather than a place that always thinks the same. But also, obviously, in the way a place physically looks. So again, you can see these things are quite obvious when one says them. These are not revelations, but it's just that somehow in the clutter of information we have about things, we forget the usual things, like, in this case, accessibility, security, the fact that this woman, in fact, she's looking at her mobile phone, typically, she's in Italy, but that the guy and the younger woman can be in that same space is quite important and significant. She feels broadly okay. He certainly does. So you get the sense of, of what we're talking about there. So security... This is sort of an element, that's why public space, this is one of the most famous public spaces in the world, it's Siena. Uh, you you recognise it. And the interesting thing about that space, if you looked at it closely, leaving aside that people are interacting, is there all the powers of a city are there. Uh, uh, political power, market power, the market is there, uh, cultural power, museum is there, and to some extent spiritual power, the spiritual power of the church is a bit further away. But anyway, that, that's a way of looking at it. So great places link and synergize. They're connected through, obviously, today in, in not only the real sense, but the virtual sense. That's, that's just found quite interesting, this shot. Everybody was on a mobile phone, so they're all in the same room, but nobody's talking to each other. That's a separate problem, which we won't discuss. But even accessibility, and I know you'll probably find this, I'm never sure how dirty you can be in America, but, you know, the pissoir, that's also a point of... Um, uh, accessibility, you know, how many public toilets have you got, um, etc. And all of that adds up to what you might call competitiveness, the performance of a place in overall terms. And that performance is not just economic money, money capital, that obsession with money, 
but it's social capital. A great place has strong social capital, financial capital, human capital, creativity capital, all of those capitals together. And any deficit of one is likely to affect the whole. So it might be doing something artistic well, as this image just happens to show. But most importantly, in a way, it's how it all comes together. I mean, clearly it's about not sticking the head in the wall in a piece of marble here. And it's about having a sense of direction where you're going, a direction of travel, which has an implication on governance. And I know there have been conversations. Don't want to talk about them at the moment. Um, et cetera, et cetera. So that, though, is the key to all of those other things I've just mentioned. Now, the other thing people are doing, and again, we won't talk a lot about this, is when you're now, and the reason we're having to do this, of course, everybody, is because I do believe the world is changing a bit dramatically and a bit fast and doing things differently. So I'm not going to say anything much about these, but just read these words. And the main word there is re. It doesn't mean that one, in fact, throws everything out, but at least one should revalue what the potential is, or an asset is, or what the flow of people, the dynamic of a city is. Capital I've already mentioned. You don't need to, you'll have this on the web, so you don't even need to do anything about this. Don't take, you don't need to take notes. But so you need to think of you, not you. We need to rethink planning, not as this sort of controlling exercise, but actually quite an exciting exercise that actually shapes and creates and makes a place potentially very interesting. That results in repositioning a city because a city in the end has layers of stories and those stories, and Pensacola has got a number of stories. I saw all those flags you had floating around. So that's already four layers of story. The question is, is do you need a new story? Or are you satisfied with the existing story uh, that you've got? Um, and that then relates to issues like governance. I'm not, I just happen to have this here in any case. Because I think in every city, nearly, there is that problem at how, how it is governed. But one of the most important things is this thing here. Normally, when someone says, where are we going? Someone says, well, the rules are. So everything about the vision is determined by the existing rules and regulations, rather than the vision or the exercise of thinking ahead being the possibility to rethink those rules and to ask, do these rules fit where we want to go? That is the central question. Normally, it's the other way around, which is why things are usually so dull. Um, so in that sense, I don't know why I've got this, but I just saw this in Australia the other day. Do you believe in reincarnation? Yes, I do believe that you can reincarnate or redevelop or re-something. Cities, you said redevelop earlier, didn't you? You are a redeveloper. Um, so next question, have your leaderships, and you note the word S at the end there, leadership, grasp the implications of this changing world? Now, we often think, this is just a picture, obviously, of the world, and the US is pretty central with a chunk of Europe and that irritating Africa there, and that's all blank over there. But it may well be, and if you go to the harbors, as you probably do, these are the cargo containers you see, completely different ones. You know, I would have put Costco there, but you might think Costco is that cheap thing. But in fact, it's China Oriental Shipping Company. But anyway, but you see lots of Costco containers in America, a lot of them. But it's not Costco, it's China Oriental Shipping Company. So I just put a Taiwanese company there, just so, to keep the China thing. So it may well be that you might have to think about this. Because you're used to seeing the world as if you are the center of the universe. But it may be that the universe is actually this. So you're shoved to the side. You're far less significant. And it may well be that, again, in the turning this world round, that this area here, which we all know is sort of the Far East and China and India, is the key thing. So I'll just go back, just a quick reminder, that that's where it actually may be happening. I mean, they thought, as you know, in China, they say, oh, we just had a sort of 400-year blip before we assume our rightful role as the center, you know, it was called the Middle Empire, or is called the Middle Empire, the center of the universe. Now, one of the things I just thought this morning in my quest to ask you the questions, what is Pensacola? And I really don't know, but I saw two images just quite immediately. So I'm not quite sure whether it's the pelican, and I can see a, a touch of history there, or it's that Seville Quarter set of buildings, which are, of course, fantastic. 
Or is it this? Is it this? Is this the culture of Pensacola that decided, you know, that that heritage stuff was all a bit rubbishy and parking was a more effective way of, uh, you get the drift. We don't want to go there. Um, or is it this? Was this the first something or other in America or in the southwest or Florida or so? First post office or something? Fantastic building. Or is it this? These are all things that are, or is it this, this newer version? That's a bit old, but new, or is it new pretending to be old? I don't know. That's all interesting thoughts going on there. Or is it this? I mean, I hope the owner of that building isn't here because it's not sort of the building, because I want to get you used to something about thinking about buildings and places as if they were to say yes or no. Does this say yes or no? Those other buildings broadly said yes. That's social you, housing. Sorry? Oh, is it? That is that 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 that, that blue thing. Shit! Christ! Right. Well, I mean, the interesting thing about yes and no is clearly that cash there is a yes thing because we know it means a lot to people in Pensacola. This building we'll talk about later. Let's just talk about. But that does definitely say no. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. But we'll come back to that a bit later. I mean, this building here is also an interesting building. Now, that might in its ugliness be beautiful. It has a certain beautiful ugliness. But shall I show you another sewage plant in a different country, which looks like this? I'm not suggesting you do that. But there are people who say sewage plants look pretty ugly. How can we make sewage plants look more interesting? Well, if you think of every pile and utility thing, da 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 da, cement works, da 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 da, got your artistic imagination, which doesn't mean being a painter, it could be just some other lateral thought, you might end up with something that is so bloody amazing that will be future heritage, because this is a destination. It's in Osaka in, in, in Japan. So, and this, this is quite interesting. I mean, this, I believe, is downtown. Now, I don't want to get into architecture and all of that, but that's not really downtownish, is it? That's sort of not walkable urbanism. This is sort of drivable suburbanism, isn't it? This, this just as an example, and you know, a lot of asphalt around it as well. I don't know how that was allowed, but that's none of my business. Um, now, so what we've been asking today, um, we'll just psychological associate to just pass that. That's in Pensacola. I'm just thinking, if Pensacola were a person, I'm not saying it needs counselling or anything like that, but I'm just saying, <laughs> what sort of psychological characteristics could we say of Pensacola? And... Oh, that, let's leave that one out. <laughs> let's not talk about that. No, no, that's contentious. I know someone's going to ask me a question about that later. But that, let's remember psychological associates for the moment. That was in the wrong place. But this is also quite interesting. I mean, who made the decision? I mean, <laughs> I don't know what to say, actually. I'm not quite sure who made this decision. Like, it's quite a nice station. There's that ugly thing there. Uh, anyway. That's broadly no. That's a broadly a no environment because I didn't see many people in this environment because it's not an environment that's encouraging you to sort of sit down, just chat to someone. And uh, this is a civic centre, isn't it? Uh, you know, just it's got a certain brutalism which perhaps has a beauty, but but. <laughs> What it seems to be lacking, we were there for quite a while, and we were looking for people, but we couldn't find any. <laughs> and it even says entrance, please enter, etc., etc. So we were, of course, relieved when we saw this old B&B, &B, which uh, I don't know what's happened to it now, but anyway, it's nice. So let's ask this question. If Pensacola were a person, what personality would it have? Would it be male or female, old or young or open-minded? If you were a total person, what would you be? Would you be well-traveled and cosmopolitan? Would you be more parochial? Would you be more wide-minded, small-minded? You can answer those questions. Would you and are you brave or more conventional? I mean, for example, have you thought of alternative transport systems? I mean, you may, 
I mean, perhaps going with the car everywhere is a fine thing. Um, you know, here it's quite interesting. This just looks like an escalator. It's an escalator, and I know you haven't got many hills, but I'm just using it as any problem you've ever thought of, there's a solution somewhere. This is an escalator that goes straight through the middle of Hong Kong. In the evening, it goes up. In the morning, it goes down. Very clever. So you don't have to go up 200 meters. So I don't know whether you've thought of other forms of transport. Because if we look at the projections that you've got for your area, it's going to be hellish, isn't it? And it's going to be a bit like this, isn't it? <laughs> and it may well be that you think this is fine. But in fact, in 10 years, you're going to be like that, roughly. Yeah? That's what it's roughly going to be like in most of the roads that come into Pensacola. It's going to be like that. So just etch that image in your mind and say, is that what we want? Because that is what it is going to be like in this region here, like that. And this is Chicago, but you're going to have to build all these stacked car parks and because you're going to be fancy and build them round and all of that. And then you might build out further because there's all this empty space because you're American. You've got lots of space. This can go on forever. If you see a night picture of America, the whole of the East Coast is a light blur, yeah? which is frightening when you think about that. I should have kept that picture in. And this, when we may be at the end of the oil economy, plus the fact it affects the way we look, because if we never walk, physically, <laughs> we change, and this may not be a good idea. Sorry, do you want, do you want to see that slowly? Just, this is you when you were very young and athletic, yeah? Sorry, anyway, I, I don't know. You might think that's, of course, far too offensive. Let's move on. But some people would say, is this really the right direction? And, you know, even here around Florida, you see the signs that tell you you should be doing a different form of development. I'm not saying you do that. But you might want to do that. That's Toronto, actually. Just in passing, just to give you another thought of another way of doing something that might be in your mind. So are you willing to focus on the distinctive? Because you've got something so distinctive and authentic, which is obviously all of this stuff, but I hope you don't get into this. That is a shop in a place, which I won't name, but it has the same sort of lovely historic qualities as you. But they end up with this. Uh, this is June, yeah, me in June, thinking about Christmas. Thank you for nothing. Or here, recently, I've just come from Annapolis, and there's another shop called Christmas Spirit, and it's still September the 19th today, so I've got to think about Christmas. Thank you. Um, so what I think is a better image to have in your mind is the movement called the slow food movement, the slow cities movement, which is associated to it. Look it up. And what you'll see, that's about understanding what your region comes from, your local food, the wine, how it's all made, reconnecting. Because all this other development I showed you is basically a description of detachment and disengagement that we have because of the way we physically put the places we, 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 we construct together. So, for example, here's another alternative just on thinking differently. This is a shopping centre, yeah? This is a British shopping centre done by the biggest shopping centre developer in the world, Lend-Lease, which has basically taken the shopping centre and wrapped the housing around it so you don't have that dull, yeah, long stretch of things blaring at you in a car park. And uh, you get the drift, uh, a lot of asphalt. So I'm just saying there are things one can do differently. Is it cities or regions or states that generate wealth? Where does the wealth come from here? You're, you probably, you actually all look rather wealthy. Um, because there's a big dramatic change that's gone on and funnily enough, it is, of course, things like this that are generating an incredible amount of spin-offs beyond the fact that there are the hundred or so workers here. Now, if that's the direction you're going, and you may decide, no, you want tourism, you may, I don't know what you're going to decide. If you want that, more of that, because it generates more wealth, then you might have to consider um, what those people like. I don't know. And they like the sort of attractive places we've described, like Siena, earlier. 
And the interesting point is, and here just is a few words just to remember, in the past when we thought what made something successful or not, you didn't find these words. And Carol Coletta was here the other day, some of you might have heard of her, and they did some work and said those four things, talent, creativity, connectivity, and distinctiveness, are the key measures that now people look to. And importantly, what she probably also said, is that nowadays people look for the city and not for the job. So if you want people, talented people of a certain type, et cetera, et cetera, they won't be saying, Is, what's the job? They'll be saying, can Ken's outfit seduce me because of the wonderful environment that he has created and everything else around Pensacola that I would like to come here? Or do I go to Austin or, or wherever else? So that talent thing is important, and clearly also the, the thing about innovation and you know, research and so on. And particularly research, we've just done some work around what generates wealth. And in fact, although mixing people of different backgrounds together is initially very difficult, in the long run, mixing people generates more innovations if you get through the problems of that initial suspicion that people generally have about each other. So that's very key, too, for a place, therefore, has to be tolerant and obviously connected in the obvious ways we've said before. But most importantly, it needs something that, to anchor it. And the problem is that as you develop, and I'm, whether you like it or not, you're going to develop because it seems that all these spaces people are trying to fill, it's important that sameness i.e. this, and I hope the McDonald's rep isn't in here. Uh, nothing wrong with the McDonald's, but there are 32,000 of them, and if we lined them up together, it would go from here to Miami, probably. And that would be a very interesting trip to do <laughs> by car. You know, one McDonald's after another. It would be a real trip in that old-fashioned sense of a trip um, of sorts, yeah? Uh, well, I don't want to think about it. So... What I'm really talking about is this other thing. And you're so flat. You're so flat. I haven't seen enough bikes. Where are all the bikes? Perhaps I just didn't look. Perhaps they are there. I just haven't looked. Or, or perhaps I'm being stupid or something. But uh, anyway, the key thing that I'm talking about, because I'm always talking about these balances, is really that thing about intimacy, village feel. A great place has a combination of village feel and metropolitan outlook. So in a sense, you've got both at the same time. Village feel and cosmopolitanism. Intimacy, but something that widens your world picture, and so on. And particularly, this as you know is in New York, it exudes a great place generosity of spirit. You can't make a great place, in my view, through a simplistic bottom line approach. A simplistic bottom line approach always is mean-spirited, and then the whole culture you know, these pinpricks of meanness, then make the whole place mean. So interesting, I feel. Now, one of the things is uh, I've been told that the prices are downtown going up, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the workforce, the general workforce that might not be an innovator, but might do lots of very important things, or younger innovators who just haven't got any money, where would they live? Would they then try to create a place in a sort of bombed out uh, car lot? I don't know. Would they? I don't know what they'd do. But I just a question I'm throwing to you. Then if you look at the 25 big cities in the world, you might think they're completely irrelevant to us because we're here, we're in the panhandle, we can bloody well forget all that nonsense about whatever it is, you know, it's all sunny and all that stuff. But actually... If you just look at these important cities, you might think, I've got zero link to them. Yeah, I have been to New York, you might say. You might say Washington, yeah, this is the capital, blah de blah de blah LA, et etc. Et but in fact, I'm not saying you're one of the 25 top cities in the world. To you, I hope you are. <laughs> to you personally, yourself. But I'm just trying to look at it objectively in terms of resonance, reputation, and power. Nevertheless, I feel, and this is me in a way saying, think about things like globalization. I don't want to use that word because it's a boring word, but it is an important word. The globalization of the world is affecting you too. And of course, these are the hubs of this globalization, the Moscows, the Miamis, you know, I suppose the finance capital for Latin America, Miami, let's say, uh, whatever. But you can't, what I'm saying, I don't think you can hide yourself away from that. Now, given that 
Now, you might not want to get into all this creativity like I'm talking about, but if you do think it's important, there is a dilemma that I feel is. Because if we think of how economies used to work, you know, the main thing was agriculture, then it was industry. Just see these words. That was the main driver of an economy. And lots of people are now saying, we're in the creative economy. We need in the creative age. We need to de... Uh, I mean, you'd probably never want to hear the word creative again. But if that's true, and everybody else is into this creativity luck, what is your emerging advantage? What is the different thing that you're going to be doing that is exceptional in some sort of way? Again, this is a question to you. Are you thinking about it? Does it matter? Et cetera, et cetera. Such a delight to be able to ask you the questions rather than you me. I mean, oh. Now, this is an interesting one. Do federal, state, county, and city powers or agendas, and the, the way people probably love each other or not, in Pensacola, do they maximize the city's potential? And indeed, what is the city? Because we also said, what is the city earlier? Is the city just the core, or is it the core and the county? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, Christ. I'll leave that one to you. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, for example, transport. Who's in charge of the roads? I mean, I presume the person who didn't put a bike path in that thing in front of that station building had something to do with the state, because probably they said it's a state road, and what the hell are you bloody doing? It's our road. Bang. And of course, as we well know, any road that looks like that and feels like that, because we all instinctively are great urban designers, every one of you, knows that the community near a place like that will die. It will always die. It will always become a negative place because it looks and feels and is negative and wasn't thought through. So instead of thinking the car is in charge, and if someone had said, how is this going to work for people who live around there, they would have probably had an interesting road solution. Whatever it is, there'd still be roads, but there'd be an interesting road of some sort. Are you future-proofing yourself? So that's beyond just saying the trend is my friend. Because at any given moment in this county, as distinct from city, there are going to be many important big things being built. Now here, I'm saying things are emotional. This is a courthouse in Canada somewhere, London, Ontario. This is another courthouse in Perth. These are buildings that say no. These are the buildings that say you are guilty before you are proved innocent. Because as you walk towards these buildings, which say no, you feel quite bad in general. You just generally feel bad. And even this building, which I know isn't a courthouse, but it has some court functions in it, I'm told. I don't really know. It doesn't matter. But this might have looked OK on the drawing board. But when plopped into the landscape, you know, these, these are buildings that are supposed to, these buildings are causing the problems they're trying to deal with in the courts. Do you see what I mean? Because they're causing crime. How can you build a building that causes crime that is, in fact, a judicial court? Which is unbelievable. Oh. My voice is going, oh. No, but you get the idea. So, oh, Christ, go away. Um, here is a police station. Now, you've all heard of the Lubyanka in Moscow, the KBG headquarters. I'm not saying this is here, thank God. But this is a police station, typical. But supposing we just thought of something in a different way. Supposing we said court buildings and police stations are not things about punishment, because those are punishment buildings, aren't they? They're punishing you because they're so bloody ugly. Plus, that's what they say. They speak authority, punishment, and all of that. Supposing I said that every new police station and courthouse should be conceived of as a center for civic engagement, would you dare build it like that? If I said, build me a center for civic engagement where we deal with and negotiate some of the problems that people feel about their life and living together, yeah, formerly called the police and all of that, it would be completely different. I mean, here's another. This is a courthouse just recently built in Adelaide. And again, I don't want to get too arty-farty, but as you go into the courtroom, you know, this makes you feel I'm not quite guilty yet. <laughs> or I might be innocent. It's a different experience, isn't it? So what I'm talking about is let's not all have these private experiences, because the city is a public experience of shared conviviality. The essence of a city is conviviality. Con with viviality living together. This is a hospital in Pittsburgh. It's one of the danger spots in Pittsburgh. Of course it's one of the bloody danger spots. The wall is blank, and that's a blank wall, and it's frightening. 
Lots of things happen that we don't want to know about there. This is another building, which is another hospital. And someone made a point about that incinerator again. This is the factory for the sick. You see an incinerator as you drive to the hospital. What do you think? <laughs> it's no joke, is it? And then you go down the corridors, and I know these corridors are all about the doctor getting from A to B quickly, doctor-focused rather than patient-focused. And this is the corridor I went to at 10 in the morning, and it says ethics committee. How dare you be in the ethics committee in such a disgusting corridor? I mean, look, this is brown. This is the brownest, it's so bloody brown, and it's 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, now, supposing we thought of a hospital as a center for well-being, as distinct from a hospital, and what is Florida's, not Florida, yeah, Florida, what is Florida's budget on preventative medicine, sort of 0.9% or something like that? when it should be 20% because it's an unsustainable medical system which is globally collapsing because we're not. We're thinking of factories for the sick. I mean, I'm simplifying as a more complicated argument, but basically if we shifted the thing to preventative medicine and centers for well-being, that might be different. This is a school. The school that says no. Now, supposing we said this is an art center, doesn't bloody matter, but it's all the same sort of stuff. Supposing I said a school is not a center for drilling in knowledge, a factory for drilling in knowledge along long corridors, da 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 da, da and said, we are building a center for curiosity and imagination. Supposing I said to you architects here, build me with me and our other soft thinking people, because you're the hard folks, I know you've got ideas, but we want some of these other people in there as well. Build me a center for curiosity and the imagination. Would it look like this? <laughs> I just leave that thought pondering in your mind. <laughs> so we can rethink everything. And there are lots of these things on the planning board, like schools, hospitals, police stations. And we must, before they're built, future-proof them. Do you... Have you truly overcome the silo mentality? Most places have a silo mentality. Obviously, there's divisions. We learned something in the past at some point. And these silos, they are, they fray at the edges silos, you know, because it doesn't work anymore. That's why these silos, you know, you have to patch them up, da, 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 because that system of thinking, working, this is why this place is so great, Ken's place, because it isn't a silo place, because it's cracked open the silos and has uh, people working across disciplines, which implies, of course, um, you know, I'm in my own box and I have to try and get out of the box, but I feel most of us need to get out of our, uh, our boxes and begin to, in a sense, collaborate. It's a form of collaboration you might not want, but it is Bosnia, um, and there was a war. But even if at the beginning we force you to collaborate, not you, but I'm speaking generically, um, that clearly, uh, in my view, is the way. So to some extent, I suppose, singing off the same song sheet. And what that means to me is a difference, because these are long, boring words, multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary. But in a multidisciplinary world, what we say is, this is a road we're building. You don't say street roads. Street's a much more interesting thing than a road. OK, my rules and codes and X, Y, Z are that. Boom. Next person, environmental services. My codes are this. Other person, my codes. So this wonderful road that you'd conceived has been chopped about by everybody saying, well, you can't do this, you can't do that. My rules are this, my standards are that. <laughs> Whereas in interdisciplinary working, what you say is you focus on the issue. You're not interested in the bloody discipline or the personality or anything like that. You say, we want to create a great street. We describe what a great street is, and a great street has some things like diversity of shopping or whatever it has and general interest and stuff like that. You describe the great street, and then you say to the discipline, and what is your contribution to creating the great street? Not what are your rules. And if they say, my rules are a bit of a problem, you say, how are we going to change the rules? Because we want a great street. Remember the point? We know what we love, but we can never build the places we want anymore because the rules forbid it. And there's a deep, big dis distinction between those two ways of operating. Now, you might think that the idea of creative bureaucracy is insanity. I love it, the idea, because 
Creative is apparently all stimulating and all that sort of stuff. Bureaucracy is supposedly dull. But actually, bureaucracy is getting a hard time because bureaucracy is actually about fairness, equality, transparency. That's, in theory, what it's about. And how can that bureaucracy become more imaginative? Because a bureaucracy, what often happens is people with great values go into bureaucracies and then something happens in the system that transforms them and means that who they are is not what they want to be or who they become. So if we look at this, just look at this for a sec. We need to move from rules, I think, law, prescription, specific, you must do this, more to principles which allow people to do things. Let me give you an example which I really like. I met a guy who was 62, and he worked in a bureaucracy, the director of bylaws and animal services in Calgary. And he said to me, I'm 62, nobody's going to sack me, I can do what I want, and I will do what I want. And he had a brown suit on as well, one of those dark brown suits. So he had everything about dullness about him. But he, in fact, was the most imaginative person I met in two weeks, which just means one mustn't be prejudiced in any sense. And he said, I'm going to pretend that the rule system of Calgary doesn't exist. There are 14 volumes of rules, you know, bylaws, noise, rubbish, dress, you get parking, all of that, you know, like sedimentation in a geological sort of thing. Rules overlay each other often, and they never got rid of. You bring a new rule in, but you don't get rid of an old rule. First rule of Pensacola, any new rule, get rid of an old one. So he then got small teams together in 15 elements of Calgary and reconstructed the rules from zero and only had one volume, a slightly fatter volume, but it was one. I'll give you a specific implication of that. There are bicycle paths, which you don't have, I note, well, because I know bikes, of course. <laughs> no bikes, therefore we don't need a bicycle path. Hey, what about the other way of thinking? Bicycle path. Uh, yeah, keep away from that, Charlie boy. Um, they have bicycle paths there, 600 kilometers. And, but they're shared with people, mothers, fathers, taking kids for walks and all of that. and push out. So they have to change. So what they have to do is, uh, anyway, he, they used to fine them $87. But the cost of the fine to administer it was $120, which means people are completely uh, annoyed and cross, so negative. So he said, what he did is he bought out of one and a half fines 100 bells and 12 screwdrivers, gave them to the 12 rangers. So now when someone like you, you look like someone who would not have a bell, so that, uh, do you want a fine of $87? Or coincidentally, I've got a bell and I've got a screwdriver. So far, nobody has said they want the fine. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> nobody has wanted the fine voluntarily. And the interesting thing with finance capital, and this is the distinction, the more you spend, the less you have with finance capital. With social capital, the more you use it, the more you get. So if you just look at these words, I'm going to speed up because I'm aware I should finish and you'll perhaps had enough. The sort of organizational culture I'm talking about is more this side here, this side here, than that side over there. So the words on the left are all hard, rigid, controlling and all of that. This other culture of this open-minded place allows higher risk. It gives lower blame. It promotes people because it makes a distinction on failure. It makes a distinction between competent and incompetent failure. Competent failure, the person gets promoted. Incompetent failure, the person gets sacked. But that's the point. Unless there is the experiment, that person tried hard to do the best of what they could. Here again, perhaps this is unfair. I'm not going to talk about this. But, you know, there could be more green stuff. I mean, perhaps you're doing wonderful green things. I don't know, you know. Uh, you may be doing stuff that I can't see. But I wish I could see it. The making the invisible visible. How would you signal to me as a visitor that you are a place that really cares both for its community and for its environment? Here in Chicago, as you probably know, this is a green roof that in the summer when it's too hot gets rid of the heat island. When it's cold, saves the heat. Amortizes itself. It pays itself back in five years. You could have some. The council could do that. You've got lots of little skyscrapers coming along. Um, you get the idea. This is Paris. This is a green building, which is partly greenwash. Greenwash means I'm only pretending to be green. But in fact, it's sending a message out, which they're doing consciously to say, we want to be green because this actual canopy is a hydroponic building, which is self-regulating. 
Again, it's sending a message. It's a city sending a message about its intentions. So that's an important point about how you show that. And again, this may or may not be an issue for you. I don't know. But how cultures, ethnicities, races, and so-and-so mix, is there the curiosity to go across the boundary to some other position? I mean, that I ask you. And I find it always very odd, because that guy on the left is a Sikh in, in Edinburgh. He has a, a tartan thing. But in fact, he owns 11 tartan shops on the, on the Royal Mile. You wouldn't think that, would you, a Sikh? And so he, but he looks like a sort of semi like a Scot, I don't know. And that other guy's a cricket fan in Australia. All I'm really saying is things aren't always what they appear to be. And of course, this is just a reminder of when we don't get on together, what can happen. That's the Holocaust Memorial in Berlin. So here, this is an interesting thing, because I think you are doing some of this. Clearly, that old city stuff is great. But in general, are words like ugly, beauty, in the standard conversation of, let's say, the city planning people, of your businesses, of your corporation, do they actually use words like, this is bloody ugly, or this is beautiful, but discuss it, of course, in a civilized way. You know, back to can we have an urban conversation without jumping it down each other's throat, but at least develop the culture by doing that. Because there are parts of your city that are primarily an asphalt experience. I mean, where we are now, of course, is not. Although this road outside there is pretty wide. It's on a hump as well, isn't it? Sort of humps up. Sort of slightly odd, like, oh, like that. This is more road. We couldn't make war road. This would have made more road. <laughs> no, I don't know. Uh, there's sort of something about the road there. But in fact, as you can see from the Boston dig, people are beginning to get rid of too much infrastructure. Now, look at this very quickly here. Underpasses, you haven't got that many, but you could do it in that disgusting one we saw a minute ago, yeah? This is Pittsburgh. Small idea, costs 2,700 a year, dollars. Boom, boom. Marilyn Monroe territory, that's her nose and that's her lips. No, we don't want that. That would make us crash. Someone will, of course, say you'll crash your car. We could go back to this one. $2,700 a year, or let's be fancy, could do that, a lighting illusion. So anything can be made more attractive, and this, as you know, is a Millennium Park. You've probably seen it squirting. So what I'm saying is we can treat the environment that we're in as if it a bit was like a living work of art, which means you occasionally use an artistic approach, but what you're doing is you've got a much bigger objective. So that's something. Here's just an example that my friends have already seen many times, which is Albania. I know you don't want to learn from Albania. But in Albania, most buildings were gray and dull and boring and gloomy and made people feel depressed and da 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 dum yeah? So the mayor spent 4% of the budget for two years on paint. So that building on the right is a Mondrian. All of these gray, dull buildings turned into something completely different. He said, I know it won't deal with the internal problems inside the building, but it'll raise the spirit. You've got the word spirited down there. It's fallen on the floor. It changes the perception of a place. Here's a collage of what it's like. So here, this is the way to the airport. Which way is it? We know <laughs> it's this way. It's definitely not that way. So it's quite an interesting use of ugly buildings, which gives you some sense of the, and again, I'm not saying you should do this, but it just proves to me there are a thousand ideas you could have. So that's what I mean, thinking of the city as a living work of art. And more or less finally, what does your sign system say about you? There are lots of signs that say, no, no dogs, no skateboard, no, no, no. And in fact, there are also other signs, which I think is good. There's a very positive sign. We stopped, drove back, said, this is a very positive sign. So lots of the signs, actually in the core, are very good signs. So that's fantastic. But just think of this for a moment. You know, most garages say, do not obstruct. This is in Logic Lane, by the way, this garage. And, but you could say, this goal is in constant use. Or not instead of saying no ball games on the grass, you could say more ball games. In some sense, to encourage that spirit of generosity. And, you know, since, you know, people like you like dogs, I presume. I've seen a couple of dogs, not that many downtown. But you might say, just for the sake of argument, it would certainly be interesting... I'll have a new zone which says three-hour barking. <laughs> now, again, I'm not suggesting you actually do it, but perhaps you should actually do it, certainly for a day, because I bet there are more... How many of you have got dogs? Hey, there's so many, all these dogs, they could be coming down there, they could be there, they'd be having fun. I'd be, oh, well, it'd be fantastic. At least for three hours, we could have them there. 
It would be, it would be memorable. And so what I'm more or less finally saying is, for me, it's switching the question. People like me have all the time had to sort of say, what's the value of creativity? What's this nonsense you're talking about? What's the value of design and art and all of this arty-farty vague stuff? I think the question much more is, what is the cost of not thinking in this way? The ugliness, the effect of ugliness. Because people, the insurance industry tells you the cost of, I need to widen that road. That we never calculate the cost of the effect of the disgusting roads we're building somehow and what they do to generate crime and all of that. If we switch the question round, at least it's not people like you or me having to defend our meaning of life all the time rather than always having to justify one's existence, which, which I've had to do all my life, and that's why I'm so probably going over the top. I've obviously gone mad in the process. Um, and that's partly linked to another question, the penultimate question, are the software thinkers, the people who think of dynamics, people, people, how people work, processes, all of that, taken as seriously as the regen lads, the guy who do the physical stuff. I bet if we look at the hierarchies of the organizations, all the guys, and probably his guys mostly, who are dealing with the physical things, who are up, and all the people dealing with the software stuff, the relational stuff, the communication stuff, have much lower uh, profile. Because many of these things, of course, are invisible. And these invisible things, again, people then say, because they're invisible, they don't count. Well, they're invisible. There's a vacancy there, as you can see on the intangible front, this shop. It's gone so badly, it's got a vacancy. And that is essentially about those blind spots I've talked about. Essentially what I've talked about is this, the senses, the emotions. When the emotions drive our life, psychology dr determines what we feel, whether we feel open or closed. How many people in the places and decisions you make take these things seriously? Instead, we just make it all a technical thing because we're frightened of actually allowing that thing that drives our life be the thing that is uh, the right and important thing. So that leads me to ask then, what organizations are the creative ones here? Perhaps you don't have buildings like this. This is Toronto. Are they in these types of buildings somewhere? Or, again, I don't think all artists are that interesting, but they could be in some of those places, some of them. It might be in these scientific places and so on. So, and finally, what kind of leaderships have you got? Have you got ordinary leaders here? Have you got innovative leaders? Have you got inspirational leaders? And I'm talking about in a collective sense. So have you got leaders? Ordinary leaders are like this bloke here. They just follow the trend. Say, someone said this, you know, what is it called? The one person action committee? Boom, I follow that. Want more car parking? Oop, I follow that. The innovative leader sort of brings interesting projects together that are unusual. But the inspirational and visionary leader draws a picture, a story of the emerging, unfolding place to be, evolving place and makes people feel they want to be an agent of that transformation and be a shaper, maker, and creator of that pace, a place. And they then obviously outline how in a paced and purposeful way one can get from A to B. So I leave it over to you. The future of Pensacola is in your hands. Indeed it is, like it says here, Gypsy Lee. It's not just some sort of thing that happens like a lottery. And it's also not an accident. It's to do with the choices you will make now and forevermore in order to leave, of course, the future legacy of Pensacola. Thank you very much. So we have time for some questions. Uh, again, please wait for the microphone to arrive once you're acknowledged. Uh, thank you for a wonderful offering. You showed some wonderful scenes and buildings in Europe. And uh, Friedman's book, The World is Flat, says that Europe is doomed because of its incredible taxation and, and, uh, and uh, ru ru too many rules, too many taxes, and it, 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 which just blotches creativity. What's your prognosis for Europe? for being creative and helping us be more creative? 
Uh, that's a difficult question. But the point is about that storytelling and that what is the place that could be. People pay more taxes when they, there is a story that they want to become and engage with. They will pay more. I talked to lots of people in Helsinki, Nokia, you know. And, you know, Nokia is not, 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 Nokia is not cold, but Helsinki is cold. And they have said, I'm willing to pay taxes that you wouldn't even believe in because there's so much social capital there. There's so much the city's giving back to me that I'm making a choice. So I firmly believe in the more I have focus groups with people is that self-centered thing, which is that thing that's so self-centered, there is, I think, a deep yearning to connect to something bigger. And when you connect to that something bigger, you've got a choice. I showed you the image of those cars. If you just let the market do its business like that, that's what you'll get. If you want that, do it. None of my business. But if you don't, it'll cost money. It'll be, have to be imaginative about parking, cars, whatever, public transport, all sorts of options. You know, here, of course, public transport, buses is, you know, for the poor. Well, in Scandinavia, for the rich, they go on the bus because they're going to have a drink. They're going to have a good time. Because <laughs> although we all think that the Scandinavians are utterly boring, they're not that boring. <laughs> Sorry, I'm being a bit flippant, but you know, you get on a high. Uh, um, outside of the United States, with towns of less than 100,000, what are the three most interesting to you? It's very difficult because, in a sense, what one really has to do is it's, it's, it's response to the question that gentleman's just raised, which is really about what is the citizen willing to pay to make a great place? How egotistical do they want to be or not? I believe there are some countries, so that's why you have to talk more about countries, which have a good balance on that thing. Because clearly, you know, lots of Italian places that are old and haven't got too much new stuff around them are great places and all of that. But then you have to ask, do the new bits of the Italian towns look that interesting? They're just as bad as the worst in England or so. Um, I think it's really about an assessment, reassessment of the incentives and regulation regime that people need to do. And to ask the question, what makes our place great? What do we want? And then make the rules fit what, what, what you want. I think... In general, you could say, uh, I would look, again, at the Nordic countries, as I've already mentioned. I would look at some German places. I would look at, 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 at Holland and so on. That, those would be the sort of countries I would look at. You know, those classic social democratic, apparently so boring, places. I think they've got a lot of lessons to learn. It's just that also my brain's scrambling as I start thinking under 100,000, da 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 And a lot of it... <laughs> I, I, th I think if, if you look at some of those countries I've just mentioned and then look under things like housing or whatever issue you want, you'll probably find a lot of innovation that, that, that is there somewhere along the line. I'll think about it. If you speak to me later, I'll probably have a city that comes to my mind. <laughs> it's quite difficult to think on the hop. Um, would you say that, like the, I guess, taking into account like the history of American culture, like um, the frontierism and like forty acres and a mule and the sense of um, space that Americans tend to have, um, do you, would you say that's a hurdle to most cities in, in the North America or in the United States, like preventing them from incorporating these kind of things into into the cities? Um, like, for example. Um, I lived in a city you showed. I lived in Hong Kong for a while, and the um, the sense of space there was quite different than here. Like a, a shop would be maybe 300 square feet, and here it would the minimum it would be like 10 times bigger. And I, I just wonder what you have to say about this. Um, this seems to be something that is difficult to shed, mm -hmm. even though it was it was only a few hundred years ago that America was settling the frontier. But I would still say it's still prevalent here. But do you think that's a hurdle? Like that, like that heritage? It's a big choice you've got to make. It's got to, you know, how do you link the public good in broadly defined and the individual together is a, is a question America has to give, ask itself. I mean, I've, I came back from Toronto recently and clearly, you know, again, people might think, uh, these Canadians so self-effacing, you know, don't dare make a decision in whatever the cliches are about Canadians. But 
in a sense, they sometimes look at you and feel that by being very focused on individual interest, one often loses something. And I think these cultural questions you're talking about are deeply significant, personally. I mean, obviously, you raise the issue about how do people f feel space in China. You know, for all I know, they're going crazy. But they certainly live in space that is different, have different habits. But I think, obviously, those things you say are correct. I think... If you've got a lot of space, you waste space like there's no tomorrow. I mean, it's the same in Australia. And I think one of the big things would be if you all had a carbon calculator, you know those calculators you have where you just basically put your lifestyle in and it immediately tells you your carbon footprint. If one suddenly said, yes, you use nine times as much as someone in Bulgaria, perhaps over time those sort of things might make people feel, shit, I'm using four Earths equivalent. You, you, do you know what I mean? I mean, so how do you change those minds? It's quite, it's, mindsets is very difficult. I mean, there is a, uh, Seattle and Boulder are doing something where they're giving the citizens these, um, this program where you monitor exactly if you change from an SUV to a hybrid car, it immediately goes down and what the average is and stuff like that. So you have to find a way, given you're so individualistic, I suppose, to personalize these things. So it's bottom up. So because the top-down approach probably, you, you know, there needs to be some innovative combination of that thing. So people feel viscerally the sort of things that, that, that I'm implying by what I say. But I do agree that culture is important in the way you've just said. And for one more Unfortunately, someone wants to ask that final question. I apologize. Uh, is there, if you were to look at cities of half a million uh -huh. or less that were declining and say, take five cities, ten cities around the world that were at that level declining and then experienced a turnaround, is there one grand defining factor that you could pinpoint to at that time where they turned around? One of the key things, that's when I said it, which was about what I called organizational capacity and leadership. It's the capacity, I believe, to think ahead. The capacity to be strategically focused on that. That's why the first question, it's a good ending question, was are you ready for the urban conversation? My first question is actually also my last because it's that capacity for a community to come together and agree on some core things, and then clearly you need to then work out what's the catalyst that's gonna make us feel that this is the thing? What is the set of key projects that make me feel, ah, this place is going somewhere? And particularly, often this is a physical thing, a building that's just changed, but often it's a mind thing, and that's where it's so difficult. That's why I said about the intangibles. How do you make the invisible changes in confidence? I mean, one of the questions I could have asked is, how confident is Pensacola? if it were a person, is, is that, that sort of then engages the confidence of people when they, so off, that's why activity programs are so important often in a sense to indicate what is actually happening in someone's mind that you can't see. So it's balancing those activity things with the physical that is very important once there is that, in a sense, common agreement between sectors and types of people. So it is ultimately about leading in some sort of way, leading collectively finding a way of having that conversation.